So without further ado, uh, Shai, let's start with you. I'll uh, allow you to share your screen because you have some uh, demos as well. So just share your screen and I'll start mine the moment you say you're ready. Cool. Just need to give us the participants uh, the option to share our screens because uh, the permission account is enabled. That's way too much. No, no. <laughs> Have it? No. Leo, maybe it's on you. Yep, I think I got the permission now. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So thank you very much, Giri, for the introduction. Hey, I want to start with an apology. Uh, the the guy in the picture in the invite looks nothing like me. It's because I got lazy and I sent an image. I didn't send an image. Leo took an image from like 20 years ago. This guy was you no. Know, in a better shape, unfortunately. Anyway. That's what happened when you don't send the credit. The, the yeah, you know, I had to uh, correlate the old age with the image that just doesn't make sense, right? So uh, I already got introduced. I'm shy. I'm uh, in this field for about 19 years, and I'm going to present a presentation that aims to give you guys a couple of trends, tools, and methodologies to spice up your penetration tests, okay? More accurately, your application penetration test in different models, whether it's a targeted application pen tests, whether it's a bug bounty, and even whether it's a red team against an organization. I'm not going to teach anyone sure. how to do SQL injections and reflections. I'm not going to talk about new attacks, none of that. I'm going to talk about tools that really, really help out the process of finding issues in generally any target, an organization, an application, a technology, et cetera, okay? So, Shai, Shai, a couple of things. One asks that you will talk slower. Again, Shai do doesn't have much time and he wants to, to manage it in time. And second, uh, get into a presentation mode. Sure. Presentation mode would be not that useful, but I'll do that because I'm going to switch so on and off. People will actually see the task. No, no problem. Yeah, Excellent. No, sure. No problem. And, and regarding the speed, I'll try. That's, you know, that's structural. I'll do my best. Okay. So move the meetup to multiply by one, uh, 0 0.5. <laughs> if you can. I'll do that. So um, the couple of things that we're going to aim to, I'm going to give you a couple of tools that will make it easier to target the app that you're testing, either by bypassing some mechanisms or just picking another instance that's way easier to test than the instance that you were given or you intended to test. I'm going to teach you a couple of cheats. That's how I treat it. It's a couple of cheats to get data that's relevant for the app that will help you during the assessment process, like the code of the application or credentials of users that were not given to you if you're doing a red team. Or other tools that can get you more content in the application that you wouldn't have found otherwise, okay? So it's generally tools and methods to make the process easier, to keep it a couple of cheats, and to make it, you know, spicier by giving you secret information normally not available, okay? So again, some of these things might be new to some of you, some of them are not. When they're unified, into a unified testing methodology. I've been testing it for the past six years and adding some components and tools into it. It's really, really effective compared to the typical attack and pen. You're just trying to hack an application without all that background information. How much more useful? You know, you can find other applications in the system that are simply not available and to those systems find vulnerabilities or APIs that were dormant and hack those. You can have, find instances of a server that, uh, doesn't have the WAF, well, like the normal production system, it's a one-to-one -one exact replica. You can bypass a lot of mechanisms and get a lot of systems through this method and tools that can generally assist you during the task at hand, okay? So um, the logic behind the philosophy is simple. If you're a CISO, and I'm not one of the, you know, I'm not associated with the school that thinks people are dumb. I don't know, I think these days in 2023, we have a lot of professionals out there. They're generally doing their job well. They make mistakes like anyone else, but when they have a system at focus, you know, there's like the main application of the bank, okay? Or the main application of the startup or whatever it is, it's generally in a decent condition, at least eventually in its lifespan. The thing that's not, in good condition, it's the components that the organization is simply not aware of. They don't know they exist. It's theirs, 
but they don't know they exist. And over the past couple of years, we've, doing, we've been doing a lot of red team exercises, red team external rating, like giving you the organization given, gives us the name, nothing else, just the name. We identify the assets of the organization. We figure out what assets the organization has. We found all relevant information to those assets, and then we preach. In most cases, the organization are not aware of more than 30% of their assets, which is a crazy number. If you think about organizations that have tens of thousands of assets, sometimes you found, find hundreds and sometimes thousands of assets that the organization is not aware of. And for those assets, it can be replicas of the applications that they are aware of. They can be dev or test instances. They can be the internal components, like the backend components of the front-end application that are supposed to be exposed, which were exposed to the internet by mistake. They can be dormant IPs and dormant applications. They can be applications on the server that was exposed that the organization was simply not aware of. And they can even be APIs that were dormant or test or dev APIs that were exposed. What we're going to talk about are generally the techniques, methods, and tools used to identify all of those. Unmonitored assets, unmonitored APIs, unmonitored parameters, unmonitored features in applications that are publicly exposed. Now, there's a reason for all that. The reason for the existence, as I mentioned, is not lack of you know, proficiency. It's typically being naive and being unaware. It's really, really hard to track an inventory for an organization. It's really rare for any organization these days to get to a 95% you know, awareness of its assets. Assets can be cloud accounts. It can be GitHub accounts, GitHub repositories. It can be servers, IPs. It can be you know, a wide variety of components that are associated or owned by the organization. And the impacts of not knowing about those organizations vary. Sometimes attackers can identify keys and code that are out there which are associated to organization and then abuse them because the organization was not aware of a simple developer that deployed it on the cloud. Sometimes it can be a server with very specific vulnerabilities. And when somebody identifies the vulnerability, the server was not monitored. There wasn't any IDS or IPS or WAF or any protection mechanism on top of it. So it was really easy for the attacker to exploit that on monitored IP or replica and attack through that. Okay, so the implications of vulnerabilities on unmonitored assets, application IPs, etc., they vary depending on what was found. The impact is typically severe, okay? Because it's much, much easier to find high impact vulnerabilities that could be sufficiently exploited on those unmonitored assets. Now, I'm going to go over the methodology real quick because I want to show you a couple of tools and I want them to fit into a mold, a context. I'm going to talk about methods to discover, as I mentioned, unmonitored assets. Generally IPs, dev test staging instances, applications which are dormant or secret, like a secret admin application on the same server in which you have your target application and a bunch of forgotten assets inside an application, which can be pages, APIs, secret methods, and other functionalities, okay? All those are our targets. That's what our time, I'm trying to achieve, okay? And we're gonna uh, get to that. We're going to get to that by finding those unmonitored IPs, replicas, and systems to the tool sets that we have, okay? So to get those elements, we have to go to a couple of phases, okay? First, we have to know what to search. <clears throat> and to figure out what we have to search, sorry for that, to figure out what we have to search, ideally we want search tokens. I'll explain and later demonstrate. When we're testing, for example, a specific application, the trademarks the application may have, A, it may be the domain name, like the application is hosted on bank.com. That's the domain name. It's probably, so the, it has an application, it's called bank.com. But there's other unique identifiers I can use to find data relevant to the application and even alternative replicas of the application. Some of those elements may be a unique certificate or an element in the certificate, the SSL certificate. 
other elements can be the title. It can be a very specific favicon or logo. It can even be a very specific subset of the HTML, which is unique. And I can take those subsets, once I know how to identify unique subsets, and run those subsets in GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, search engines, and get a ton of data relevant to the application. I've had, I won't say numerous, but at least dozen of instances where I found the actual code of the application with test data on Docker Hub. I just downloaded the same application I was testing from Docker Hub because taking the signatures enabled me to search and find that the container used for development was uploaded as is to Docker Hub. How much easier would it be to do a pen test or bug bounty approach when you had all the code, test data, and the live instance of the system at your disposal? instead of just doing a black box or gray box in front of you know, a remote instance, okay? So getting search tokens organization requires you to analyze the HTML content of the application, the certificate, the organization, the brand names, and a couple of other things which are relevant to the application itself. Once you have search tokens, generally elements you can search on the distinct application, you can run those search tokens in a couple of ways. A, you can find subdomains and domains that are associated to those tokens. Like for example, if it's bank.com and the name of the bank is bank of country, you can run subdomains with similarity to find subdomains associated to it. You can find IPs that match those signatures by searching in IP databases or response databases, and I'll get to that. You can find accounts associated to all those search tokens, et cetera, et cetera. You can also run all those search tokens in code and container repositories or in credential repositories. For example, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, et cetera, or credential repositories. At the end of that process, you will find assets which are either replicas of the applications, unprotected replicas, dev, test instances, or if your target is not necessarily an application, you're testing an organization, you would see a ton of applications that match those signatures, which you will be able to verify are owned by the organization and are in fact an unprotected or unmonitored entry point into the organization, which has, I don't know, 10% of the protections that the main applications of the organization will have. Then you will be able to run a couple of additional processes, which we'll get to in the end, primarily search patterns and fuzzing techniques to find additional applications and additional entry points to tackle the application. At, at the end of this process, you will get to the good old pen testing phase much, much more equipped than you were before, okay? much, much more equipped than you were before. And, you know, it, 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 I won't say it will be necessarily easy, but you'll have a better starting position than just starting to tackle your application than you would have before, okay? So a couple of tools we use on a regular basis just to spice up, and I'll start showing those. It's really useful as a tester that uses this methodology because you'll be blocked a lot, okay? A lot to use a VPN, for a couple of reasons. A, we found that some dev test instances that you identify are only accessible from the origin country. So let's say you're testing a server in Canada and you, find, you found an admin server. If you try and access it, sometimes you'll get a bland response or no response at all. If you simply switch a country to a specific, you know, to the specific target country, Somehow you'll, you'll get access to the interface. You'll be able to test it and abuse it. It's really useful if you found internal assets or backend components associated with the replication or rev or dev or test dev replica. Just using a VPN is you know, key. I, I typically use NordVPN and ExpressVPN. There's a bunch of other services out there. It doesn't really matter. Really useful for once you found the IP just to access that relevant asset. Content replicas, um, you know, you know, I think that's the start, that's the start. Uh, the best thing I can do is, you know, start the demo and stop talking and show you what I mean, okay? So the first thing I want to do is talk about search token and show you what I mean. I'll be using a ton of services to identify search tokens, but generally I'll be trying to identify organization brand names and alternative names, application brand names and alternative names, domain, subdomains associated with specific application, 
unique signatures in the application certificate in various fields, the CN, the O, the registrant email, favicon, icon, and even images in the application and the hashes. That's a, not necessarily a big deal. The other ones are probably bigger. And search by title and content, which is pretty big, okay? And I'll be using a couple of tools here. In terms of domain, subdomain numeration, you know, let's say we have an organization. Let's say we have Verizon.com, okay? So doing a subdomain numeration for Verizon will already give me a couple of search tokens, okay? I'm going to use DNS dumpster for our, my presentation. There's a ton of tools out there. It's a good one. I'll be using two, okay? So getting assets of Verizon, pretty easy. You run DNS dumpster or DigDAO or whatever you want, whatever subdomain numeration tools you have, you can find tools. You can even find replicas of specific application. For example, if I take a specific Verizon application or, you know, Microsoft application, doesn't matter. Like, let's say, loginmicrosoft.com. Let's use loginmicrosoft.com. I can sometimes get replicas, like dev and test replicas under Microsoft.com. Okay, so sometimes I see login Microsoft.com and then dev login Microsoft.com and then test like login Microsoft.com. So just the subdomain enumeration can give me replicas. I can also search for other names for the same servers. Okay, and that can give me alternate names. Okay, alternate, it's a feature, it's a very simple feature in, a, in a DNS Dumper. It can give me alternate names of the same application. Okay, but then I can also do a deeper process. So I'm presenting to you another tool, it's called Pentest Tools, it's a fantastic tool. Again, there's competitors, I'm not advocating one tool or the other, it's just a useful feature. And they have a feature called Find Domains. Okay, let's see if I can actually find it. Okay, so what you do there, let's say I'm, I'm entering Verizon here. So what it will do, it will go to the certificate repository and a couple of other repositories, and it will try and find organizations owned by Verizons or alternative names of Verizon owned organizations. It will generally find alternate names and subsidiaries. So let's say there's a company that Verizon or Microsoft or whoever bought, it's very likely that I'll see the company name in the list. So I will be able to identify alternate names and alternative names for that. It will be useful because I can identify other domains which are associated with Verizon. For example, Verizon Dev oh, or Verizon Labs. And maybe the replicas that will help me out in the pen tester, in the pen test will be under those domains, okay? So I'll be able to, one way to identify assets is subdomain enumeration, domain association, and then again, subdomain enumeration to identify those assets. I'm running those, you know, I'll write that in the background. Verizon is a big organization, so I'm not sure it's going to be completed by the end of the presentation, but maybe we'll get back to it. But as a general rule, finding assets, domains, subdomains, that will be the initial search tokens. Because let's say there's a specific application here that's relevant for me, okay? The name of the domain is a search token. I can search it in GitHub. I can search it in GitLab. I can search it in index repository. Just the name of the domain that's interesting for me is a search token, but it's not the only one, okay? There's other search tokens that I can use, which is a good time for us to introduce another tool sets in our, you know, Swiss army knife, okay? And that's response databases. There's a couple of names for that. I'm not sure response, response databases are, is the, the right term. For example, Shodan calls itself computer search database, okay? Or, or computer search engine. There's a bunch of names for the category, okay? So I'm going to present a couple, okay? Let's take, you know, Giddy, you want to participate or about some interaction? Want to throw an organization that's interesting to you? Anything. Yeah, Give anything that you want. No, really, just... Anything yeah. that can to the, to the audience. Something small enough or something decent? Whatever you want. Try a cider. What, then? what do you think? No, I, I, I doubt what that else? cider is still uh, exist. Cider like right? that? I mean, the website. No, cider, I guess it did. Cider with Y, right? Not I. Oh, ah, is that right? Why cider no. like that? No, we, no, we are cider, uh, we were cider dash security. Uh, C I D E R. And it's C I, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, with a C I. So oh man, you're not very famous. I think Palo Alto kind of. Well, Palo Alto is now, now it's even more famous than before. No, we, we have, give, uh, we... give me anything, that, something that exists, like any, literally anything. I can try on one if you want. I can go back to Verizon if you prefer. 
Not, not until somebody is really, is really interesting in some asset, let's go for Verizon, okay? There's a bunch of stuff there. The searches will be longer, but they will be interesting, that's for sure, okay? So what I'm saying is there's a couple of tools I'm presenting. I'm presenting four. I'm not sure all of them are in the presentation. I'm presenting Census, okay? I'm presenting Shodan. I'm presenting LinkAX. I'm presenting Fofa. It doesn't really matter. Some of them are better than others in some aspects. Some of them are better than others in some zones. For example, I've, I'm typically using a, a Zoomai a lot these days in census. And I had an instance where both of these, the cycle of hyper recognition they're going through, didn't identify a publicly exposed uh, um, RDP, but Shodan did. But in most cases, it's the other way around. Shodan doesn't have the assets and the other ones do. For example, Verizon.com has 2,500 assets documented. You'll run that in Shodan, you know, Verizon.com. You'll get results, definitely, but you'll get less, like 52 results documented, drastically less. So some of the services have more results than others. Some of them surprise you sometimes, even though they don't have all the results, they're better at some, you know, some areas, okay? But I'll take, take the approach. So I can search for organization signatures by analyzing the SSL certificate. So the SSL certificate will have a couple of fields that isn't interesting for me. There will be the CN field, there will be the O field, which is the organization name, and there will be the registrant. Sometimes there's a registrant, like an email, okay? I can use syntax in all those engines to search for those specific elements. For example, I can search SSL, Verizon, and space. And note the number here. You see 2,400? Two, Look at the number now, okay? It will be way more. And I can narrow the search down to something that's actually organization equals Verizon, okay? And that will give me a much, much more accurate result, but you can see all those are Verizon IPs. They don't even have a domain name associated to them. There's no domain name. It's a rogue IP. There's a bazillion of those, okay? Which is directly exposed to the internet. And I can get to that now. Okay, so one search organization is elements of the certificate. It can be the CN, it can be a very specific field, like O, it can be whatever you want. Other elements can be inside the content, for example, title, okay? Well, I can take a specific title and search by the title, okay? Like, let's say I have a very specific title to my application, like Verizon Super Admin Application. I can search for very specific instances of Verizon super admin application. I don't, I don't know if there's an actual, no, I'm just trying it. Hey, what do you know? Okay. There is a title called Verizon admin and we're seeing it and there's one. See that? I swear to, I swear to God, that's like a random one. Okay. But you can actually search for alternate instances or special instances associated to your application. Okay, it can be a, a management console. It can be anything, as long as you search the various elements relevant to it. Now, when you're doing a back bounty for an organization, for example, you can get to the super secret admin applications of that organization through that syntax, as long as they're documented in those services. And you can do something similar in census. For example, I can there search for host in census, okay? I can do the same in, you know, in Shodan. Then I can do those searches and syntaxes in the other tool sets. Eventually, I'll be finding a bunch of assets, IPs, servers, accounts, SaaS services, etc., associated to the search signatures that I have. Usefulness, if I'm targeting organization, I can find targets associated to organization through those search signatures. Other benefits, let's say I'm testing a very specific application. I've had numerous occasions of searching something unique in its certificate or even the domain name and finding IPs that don't have a domain name associated, which will test or dev or even internal components of the same application, which I can now target. Okay. So those search services, those search, you know, those server databases or computer search engines, call it what you wish. Enable me to get other targets associated to my organization, application, what bug bounty target, etc. Okay, just by running the search and service search elements I wanted in those search uh, services. Generally, names, CN names, brand names, titles, etc. 
okay? And eventually, after I get all the search engines, I can start to wrap up the targets that I, that I get, like acquire the relevant targets that I need in terms of servers, IPs, accounts, etc., etc. So I recommended three, but there's you no, know, obviously the more, there's Shodan, Likaik, Census, uh, Zuma, I think there's at least six more that you can use. And we use them to, uh, with the search queries, the, the, you know, the, the search tokens of organization names, subdomain, certificate title, favicon hash, et cetera, et cetera, to gather up the targets, okay? Just for those of you who are not aware, you can actually take the hash of the favicon and there's specific syntax to search by the icon hash, okay? It's not common to find something that's relevant, but sometimes you do. So it's another tool in the, you know, that you can use. So once we found those servers or assets or cloud SaaS accounts that are associated to the organization, we can start to narrow down the search and find for relevant information to that target application. So let's say we found our target. Maybe we have the target in advance because the engagement is, hey, you need to pen test app.bank.com. That's it. So we found dev replicas of it and test replicas of it, maybe even if we got lucky, an internal backend service that serves the same server, okay? That, that's pretty much what we can find in the context of an application pen test. If it's a bug bounty or a rent team engagement, we can find 200 applications or 5,000 applications of that organization. Now we can get more data relevant for either the organization or the application in the end using the same search tokens. Again, we isolated the organization name. We isolated the application name. We isolated the certificate. We isolated domain names. All those search tokens can now be used to gather more information. Which information? Let's start. A, code, keys, credentials, and secret URLs in the application. All those are elements you can get. B, live containers with actual test data of the application that we're testing or the organization that we are testing, okay? C, employee or user credentials for that application, okay? Or at least usernames, at least usernames, which we can then use in a brute force attempt or password spray attempt. D, documentation. Sometimes that's useful, okay? So for example, I had a customer, which is, you know, it's a multi-made customer and it, has, it had a system and I found a documentation of a replica of the system and that documentation had internal URLs and the internal URLs had a critical vulnerability. So finding the documentation was still useful and I couldn't find it if I didn't use the, the hash, uh, the hash of the icon. I got to the documentation by getting, by using the hash of the icon. Okay, so again, the search tokens bring us all those elements. And last but not least, replicas, okay? I can still find replicas through those search tokens, okay? And that's another spice up for that. It could be like an IP or a lab, or maybe even another instance of the same application in another customer, if it's a shelf product. Sometimes we are assigned with testing shelf products. So finding a shelf product can get us additional information, which will was indexed only for that shelf product in another customer. And then we can use that data for our instance. So it's it's vogue, I'm giving you examples, it's not everything you can get, but those search tokens can give us a lot, okay? So let's go for the obvious thing. Let's go for, you know, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, all those to give you a couple of examples, okay? So let's go to GitHub, you know, as an example. So in GitHub, I can search for those search tokens that I found. So let's say, I figured out that the Verizon application uh, uh, is written in Java and the name of the application is A, B, and C, okay? I can search for that data in GitHub with very specific pattern. For example, if the application is written in Java, I can search for all the Java code associated to Verizon in GitHub. For example, import, that's a Java search pattern. There's a bunch of those. Import com dot a Verizon, that's it, that's my search token. So that's repositories that import from com.verizon. Then if there are such repositories, let's see, maybe they, they're not strong on the Java part, let's try Microsoft. If I'm getting none here, then I'm not authenticated. Okay, I'm getting stuff here. I'm just not signed in for some reason, weird. Okay, so guys, didn't expect that. 
should have been logged in. Ah, uh, I'm not going to do recovery right now. I think I know what the problem is. Yep, sorry. So guys. In the meantime, you have seven more minutes. That's the... <laughs> well, I'll start running. And, and not trying to push or anything. Yeah, yeah, I know. Didn't you uh, finish the uh, five minutes earlier? I think you did. Will, uh, yeah. Maybe that's still a minute or two. No problem. Okay. So, um, anyway, I just wanted to give you a search, a search pattern. For example, those calls like import.com.microsoft.com will suggest that this is a library that is using at least something for Microsoft. I can use package, which is meaning this code is by Microsoft in Java. It's a package that's written for Microsoft, com.microsoft.com, that's a convention, which is of Microsoft. Now I can use the same for Microsoft.application name to make the search more distinct. Okay, for example, Microsoft.z3. If my application name is Z3, I can find code relevant for Z3. If, if there's some third-party developer or developer that gets sloppy, I'll be able to find the code of the application I'm testing or this fragment of it. Now, the conventions change from technology for technology. For example, for .NET, it will be using and the naming convention will be different. And for Ruby, it will be different and so on and so on. But searching for code convention relevant for the application the organization and the technology I'm testing can give me, get me the code. Same thing applies for containers. Let's say for God, let's say I'm going for Docker Hub, okay? And in Docker Hub, I can actually search for containers relevant for a specific application or an organization, for example, Verizon, okay? And if I have the name of the application, maybe, you know, whatever it is. So there's a couple of images by Verizon Digital, but sometimes you'll find somebody, sometimes a developer like Karen Twanir, that uploaded something for Verizon, like Verizon Rabbit. Maybe that's a system that I'm testing and it's relevant for me, but it's not supposed to be exposed. It was exposed by mistake. And using those search tokens will get me to that extra information I need for my assessment, okay? So again, repositories of code, repositories of uh, container, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, I can also search for accounts relevant for my target, okay? I have the search tokens. Those are typically domain names at least. And if I have the domain names, I can search for credentials. There's a bunch of you know, credential repositories. I'm not going to go to the typical ones like Pestbin, et cetera. I'm going to go to a dedicated one just to present what I want. So let's say I'm going to Intellix, Intelli uh, Intellix which is Intelligence X. It's one vendor. Again, I'm not advocating a specific tool, but if I'll search for Verizon accounts because I found a Verizon admin application, I have like at least 70, 60, uh, you know, text files. At least some of them are credential leaked text files. And those are, are Verizon accounts. Some of those accounts might work on the secret admin interface I found. Some of them might give me emails or usernames or whatever, or phone numbers that I can use for the process I'm trying to achieve or the time to attack, okay? So again, more information, I'm using the search tokens here. It can be a domain name. It can be just the name. It doesn't have to be a domain name, like Verizon. It can be something else, okay? Like through that, I can get uh, additional uh, accounts that I can use for my assessment process, okay? So eventually, I'll have assets. I'll have information of the assets in the form of code, credentials, secret URLs, links, everything I found in the repositories, and maybe even credentials, okay? Now, it's the phase of identifying additional elements inside the application. Secret applications, secret entity points, secret features, caches. So I'm going to use a couple of techniques. I'll start with the easy ones. A, cached content. You know, those of you who are pen testers, you, know, you were probably taught about Google Hacking a bazillion times ago, years ago. It's not new. You take the, the URL of the application. For example, I'm using Tech, Tech API Pro. It's one application. And you can say, give me all the JSP files that Google knows about Tech API. And you'll get a bunch of JSP files that Google indexed. And you can do the same in Bing, and you'll get stuff in Bing, which is typically different. Eventually, you'll get some assets. 
others, you know, we can go to Wayback Machine and you'll see other instances of the website and maybe you can scrap stuff from there. I want to show you something pretty useful that not many people know, okay? You know, it, it's not secret by any means, but it's really useful. Once I have my application or even the replica of the application, sometimes my target application is brand new and it wasn't indexed, but a replica of that was indexed. Taking the, the domain name of my applications or of its replicas, it's worked using all of those, will give me a ton of URLs that were indexed in Wayback Machine for that application over the years, okay? Over the years. And it can be a ton of URLs, really, genuinely a ton of URLs. For example, login.microsoft.com. This plugin, Wayback Machine in Burp Suit, will go to that domain name historically since 1999 and take all the URLs that Wayback Machine knows of on that assets and give you a unified presentations of all the URLs there. Okay? A ton of URLs starting from 1999 to today, which you can get for a target that you have, for its replicas, and even for similar systems. And that's a very good baseline. Okay? You can know of every publicly exposed from a, a URL, even if it was exposed for a day, as long as it was indexed in Wayback, and you can get it all in one wrap-up. Pretty useful for the initial batch, okay? You do that, you run those in a fuzzing dictionary, you'll get to, you'll get, you know, default old obsolete entry points and sometimes even administrative applications or features, okay? Just by doing that. Second element we want to talk about is fuzzing, okay? It's not new, many printers use, use it, but once you have all the information in search tokens, you can create your own dedicated, unique fuzzing list. You can create it yourself, you can wrap it up, you can create something useful for the technology. For those of you who don't know about the repository, I really, really recommend a Seclist. Um, it's a repository on Google, on uh, GitHub. It has a ton of technology specific fuzzing dictionaries. Okay, I use customized versions of that, but you know, each one of you can customize it. There's stuff for Java, for .NET, for many, many technologies. And running those with the customizations and search tokens we had earlier can identify a ton of resources, which are, you know, secret entry points, et cetera, et cetera. For the demo I prepared in advance, just a sec. For the demo I prepared in advance, I used, uh, you know, Burp Suit Intruder. Um, just get to it. I used Burp Suit Intruder, nothing special about it. You take an application in Burp Suit, you set up an Intruder uh, session and you run it and eventually you'll get secret files, secret directories, secret everything you want. And if you spice it up with, uh, you know, the data from, earlier, like if you found the source code repository and you add names from the source code repositories, like directory names and code names, you'll get additional directories and additional applications, okay? And you can, you know, you can fuzz the directory name, you can fuzz the file name. So I guess the only thing important here, you got all this information. It's important to make use of it. Some of the uses is finding additional applications just by fuzzing and identifying them. And some of the uses in finding additional entry point. For obsolete technologies, I'm not sure obsolete is going to, but you know, old school technologies, SP, JSP, PHP, et cetera, it's really important to fuzz for file names with known extensions like JSP, PHP, SPX, SMX, whatever is relevant for the technology, okay? Some technologies, should have a pretty straightforward fuzzing sequence if you want to identify those secret applications. For example, in .NET, ASP.NET, MVC, .NET HVC, .NET Core, I would typically do a tech fingerprint to figure out what the technology. If I would do a fuzzing for SMX, SPX, SHX, the typical technology extensions, okay? Then I would spice it up with exploits that get me additional content. For example, in .NET, there's short name scanner exploit, which gets you additional information. In And then you can run short name scanner on the root URL and on uh, sub URLs, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm, that's an example. We don't have uh, enough time to explain it, but the short version is you have a technology. Our aim before we start the pen test is to identify additional targets additional URLs, additional applications, you can use an exploit which is relevant to the technology to do just that, 
okay? So short name scan, fantastic for .NET, Java has its own merits, and PHP has its own merits, et cetera, et cetera. Running CGI's dictionaries from set lists, like Microsoft CGI's, Java CGI's, et cetera, et cetera, specific to the technologies will give you further information, okay? And, you know, the process goes on. So each technology would have its own fuzzing dictionary. It will have its own exploits to get additional information. But at the end of that process, I would have a bunch of URLs that are relevant to the application, which brings us to the final phase, okay? And how, how am I going to do it, Gideon? I have a minute or two? Uh, uh, one or two minutes, and uh, then the two questions. Okay. The, I mean, uh, okay. So, at the end of the process, we found IPs, replicas, etc. We found a, a code relevant to them. We found credential relevant to them to those search engines. We populated all that into Burp Suit or Zap or whatever tool you're using, and then we fast for additional entry points. Our interception proxy will now be filled with a ton of data that's relevant to the application. We're not through yet. We can sell search for additional content. We can do that by analyzing the HTML. Bebsu does some of it on its own, but I found it's nowhere close to what you can get if you do something manual. And I recommend either Zap search or Burp search while using conventions and extensions and search tokens that you found previously, okay? So if it's a .NET application, I'll search for SPX pages in the responses of the application. And I'll find, I promise you, a ton of secret SPX, SMX, SHX pages relevant to the application because I have all this content, which is secret, which I analyzed and documented. And now I'm doing those searches and I'll find furthermore if I'll analyze it further. I can do you know, the same for the typical search tokens we have. Like for example, I can search for patterns from the code I found in GitHub. Okay, I can search for elements and eventually all those mix and matches searches will get me additional content. And after getting all that additional content and on replicas, which are less protected of my target application, then I can go and start my good old pen testing routine. I will start it with a much, in a much better position. I'll have unprotected replicas. I'll have secret URLs. I'll have, you know, code, I'll have credentials, and my results will be, you know, in the same proportion. Okay, that's it. Questions, anyone? Yes, yeah, so there are a couple of questions. So Victor asked for two questions. One, I think it was from the beginning of your presentation. What about IP whitelisting bypassing? Any recommendations there for Recon? Yeah, so for a specific IP, I don't have good recommendations except hacking a server that's, you know, would enable you. You can use attacks, like if let's say there's a system and it has SSRF vulnerability and you have, you are targeting another system and they're correlated. Maybe the IP of one system can enable you and the vulnerability in it can enable you to bypass uh, the, the IP restriction by using SSRF from one system to another. But it's really situational. What I'm proposing here is something much simpler. It's very often enough, simply country IP restriction. It's often the case. Just use a VPN, use another country, uh, you know, that's in parallel or in proximity to the target. For example, I, sometimes uh, the US, self, US uh, assets and Canada, Canadian assets, I use the, you know, just use Canadian IPs, it was good enough, okay? Or, you know, you can find other offices and, you know, sometimes that's enough and see what the offices of that, that organization is, use a country from that, you know, where the office is at, and you can bypass the IP restriction. Next question. Next question. So the next one, okay, I see two more questions from Victor. And that, then the next one is, I'm not sure what tool was used, but how does AMS compare for enumeration uh, to what was presented? Oh, I, I want... don't recall when. Can you present the question? I mean, AMS, maybe if you can. Yeah, but ask... you, can, you can see it in the Q&A section as well, but... Uh... See, and, uh, and Victor, if you have some something to add uh, in text in the chat or in the Q and A section, feel free to add. I, I don't know. I I'm not using AMS, so I don't know how to compare it. To be to be, to be honest, AMS, AMS is a manual testing. You can fuzz uh, subdomains and domains and DNS and whatever. It does it fast and so, good, so, but it's not a service. So my 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 approach is I tried a couple of engines. 
I use four for subdomain enumeration, and they always surprise me. It always surprised me how much they complete each other. So I use, you know, one, I use a DNS dumpster, Pentest tools, a very specific Palestinian website, which is pretty good, and another one, okay? It doesn't really matter. I merge, I merge the results from all of those, and I get pretty interesting results, you know? And they, they complete each other, and no tool can generally give you everything. Excellent. So la last question, and then we, we must run uh, the next one to Yuval, that is, uh, you know, anxiously waiting to, to present as well. So Victor asks another one, is there a checklist you have or would recommend when using BS to check for outside of what BS identifies automatically? Checklist you have to recommend checking. I don't know what, you know, BS is acronym. I'm I would say bullshit, but again, it does Yeah, what's it? okay. Okay, I would say that Burp Suit ne is I, a I'm, I'm not, okay. I really like Burp Suit. It's my kind of favorite tool these days, obviously, like everyone's favorite. I really don't think Burp Suit finds a lot automatically at all. I would highly, highly recommend to avoid using the Discover content exclusively. You can use the verbs to discover content exclusively, but doing fuzzing manually would get you way better results, okay? The more you do it, the more we'll become experienced in doing it, you know, just fuzz for directories and files and subdirectories and files inside those subdirectories. Many, over time, you'll see a big difference in what you find compared to what verbs it finds on its own, you know, unattended. Okay, any other questions? I think that's that's pretty much sums it up. Again, there is another one, but I will wait it uh, for later uh, because we need to rush. Okay. 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 So, uh, Yuval, 